Welcome to Makers Church. If you're here in our courtyard and if you're at home online or wherever you might be, we're so glad that you are with us today. If we've never met, my name's Derek, and I have the absolute privilege of serving here at Makers Church as the lead pastor. And uh, we are in a really special season together. Um, if you were with us uh, last week, we, we, we promoted a couple of things that were kicking off this week, and um, we started 40 days of prayer and fasting, like Oscar talked about, um, on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. And I think one of the neatest things about seasons like this is there are literally millions of followers of Jesus around the world that are participating in Lent right now. And I think if that doesn't speak to the solidarity of a, a spiritual practice and a spiritual tradition, um, that should be encouraging. It should be inspiring that that there are thousands of years of history and millions of people today practicing something together. And I think we can, we can get so jaded, we can get so lost on these ideas of, of things that can seem religious or ritualistic. And so we choose to just kind of throw them all out, baby with the bathwater. We can have all of these accusations and we could point fingers based on past experiences or even people we know's past experiences or even just movies, you know? Uh, it's interesting when you think about religious things, when you think about like religious rituals, um, you can feel like, yeah, that, you know, it's not about that. It's about relationship. You can fill in all the blanks and, and we could lose the significance and the power of what happens when we practice something. And if you're like my son, Blake, uh, you just want to be good at something without practicing. And I was that way as a kid, too. I just want to be good at it. And I think when we, when we start thinking about what it means to follow Jesus and be like Jesus, it was funny, I was uh, preparing this sermon and I was looking for something on my computer and I use the search feature all the time in the top right, I just put a word in and it brings up all this stuff. And it actually brought up some old prayer journals of mine. And just this morning, up there in my office, I, I started going down the rabbit hole of college Derek. And it was like, wow, I've come so far and also I have it in so many ways. And I was confessing in this prayer journal that I was trying to do all, all of this, to be like Jesus on my own power. Uh, and when the moment called on it, I was not that way. It's because I was out of practice. I wasn't practicing the way of Jesus. And so that's what we're leaning into together for the next 40 days. We're going to practice some things that... If we let them, they could become ritualistic and routine. But if we reject that, they could become powerful and transformative in our lives. For many of you, the season of Lent is something that you've practiced for many, many years. Maybe your whole upbringing you've practiced it, depending on your faith tradition. For some of you, you're only... Uh, a, a, Awareness of Lent is maybe Fat Tuesday and, and, and how it relates, you don't know. Uh, maybe you grew up um, in the Catholic Church or in a, in a high church thing, and these things are they're very common to you. Maybe you grew up in a, in a non-denominational church, and all of these things are foreign to you. And it's interesting, when, when you look at Christian history, uh, we've, we've pitted ourselves against each other. And I think so many times what happened, like, from the Reformation forward is we said, oh, all of these things, are they, they've lost their way, and so we've just thrown them all out. And today, the thing that I want to talk about is one of those things, and it's this, this spiritual practice, this discipline called confession. And if you grew up with a certain faith tradition, you might, you might think that confession is maybe sitting in a booth with um, a, a faceless stranger on the other side, a priest who you can confess your sins to, and, and then you can be, um, have your, your, your sins absolved at that point. And, and there was a, it was a transactional experience. I've messed up. I need to get clean. I need to do that again. And maybe that was your experience. Or, or like I said earlier, if, if you grew up maybe in a, in a Protestant denomination, maybe you've never even heard about confession. And maybe you fall somewhere 
in between. But as we lean into this new series that we're kicking off today, as it's in collaboration with our, our 40 days of prayer and fasting, like, uh, like Oscar said, you can opt into that. And um, I don't know about you, but, but there's this, this phrase that we've been kicking all around here a long time. It says, where you lack structure, you must implement discipline. Where, or where, where, you lack, where you lack maturity, you must implement structure or discipline, right? And I, I will get this wrong all the time, but if this thing comes to my phone every day and it's like, hey, dummy, quit looking at Instagram and read these scriptures and, and reflect on this, that really helps me. And so our team has put together an amazing experience for us to, to practice this thing together. And I think what the one thing that we want to do is we want to fully lean into the idea that, that the symbolisms and the habits and the practices, that they can be really powerful, but in and of themselves, they're nothing. So, so the ashes that, that go on our forehead on Ash Wednesday, they don't do anything. But they're symbolic, and if they're tethered to the realities of our hearts, to a repentant heart, to a, to a heart that is pro- professing and proclaiming that I am broken, and I'm reflecting on my brokenness, then it, it can be, be a really powerful symbol. So we're in this series called Ashes to Ashes, and it's, it comes from the scriptures. There's a, a, a passage in the book of Daniel. We'll get to there maybe at the end if I talk fast enough. But th- there's a passage where he is, so he says he's covered in sackcloth and ashes. And he's practicing a spiritual discipline of, of discomforting himself, putting on like a, a really uncomfortable garment to be reminded of his brokenness. And he's sitting in ashes as, as symbolism of how, how earthly he has become. And he models for us what it would look like to come before God and confess our sins. And, and really this whole season of Lent, it's, it's about us reflecting on our brokenness. And, and, and it, it, what it does is it shows the delta, the gap between our brokenness and God's goodness. As we drive towards Easter, as Easter we celebrate Jesus dying and resurrecting and, and, and being our pathway to a renewed relationship with God. And that's all happens in the context of his grace and of his mercy, of nothing that we've done to earn it. And so this is a season of repentance and confession. It's a step towards repentance. It isn't repentance in and of itself. Repentance is choosing to turn the other way, to to acknowledge, to realize, to call it out, and then to turn away from it, to change your thoughts, your actions, your behaviors about something. And confession is a step towards it. It leads us to the place where we realize our sin and brokenness. And it's an important process that we lament it, that we mourn it, that that we reflect on it in such a way that we come to realize the power that it's having over us and choosing to render it powerless as we bring it to God. Confession is an invitation not only to identify our sin, but to grieve it, to lament it. It's so interesting when you think about confession because, you know, when when we actually get to the place in our journeys where, where we come before God and we confess, it's not like he's surprised. Right? It's not like he's like, oh my gosh. He doesn't say, oh my God. But he's like, oh my gosh. Like, I'm so shocked. I had no idea. It's so interesting. We, we have a, a, a three-year-old named Aubrey, and we say this about every age, but it's the best age, you know. And she's at that place in her life right now where she will do something in front of you. You saw her do it. She, like, kicked the dog or whatever she did. You're like, Aubrey, why would you kick the dog? She's like, I didn't. And you're like, I saw you kick the dog. She's like, I didn't kick the dog. <laughs> and it's like, Aubrey, you kicked the dog. We saw you kick the dog. You kicked the dog. You have a chance. One more time right now, just tell us you kicked the dog. We saw her kick the dog. We know she kicked the dog. We're trying to get her to confess, to tell us she kicked the dog. 
And I, I have to confess something to you. We have taken on the worst parenting hack on the planet. Our kids literally believe there are Arlo cameras everywhere. <laughs> and so when our kids do something and we're trying to get them to confess, to get them to, to, to fess up to what they did, even if we didn't see them, we're like, oh, do we need to pull up the Arlo footage? And we threaten them with that all the time. They literally think Arlo's everywhere. And so we'll threaten them. It's terrible. Don't do it. This is not parenting advice. Our kids literally feel like they're living in the book 1984. It's like the big brother's watching all the time. But we, we think kids are like this. We're like this. We're like this. I didn't do it. But listen to what, listen to what David says in, in, in the Psalms. He says in Psalms 139, he says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, and you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. See, this is the, the confusing thing, the, the, the challenging thing about confession. God already knows. And if we let ourselves, we go, I don't got to tell him because he already knows. And if God already knows, he knows. It's like, you know, the secret between me and you, God. Don't tell nobody else. And so if God knows, if he knows, if he knows our thoughts even before they come out of our mouths, then why should we confess? And that's a big question that has really, I think, shaped much of our Christian tradition. Many, many arguments over this. And what you see happening is, is like, say, in the Catholic Church, no, 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 like, every time we sin, we got to confess. And, and the, if, you, if you search the scriptures, they'll show you that it's, it's good for you. We should do this. It's a habitual practice that we should be in. But if you go kind of to the extreme other Protestant kind of view, it's like, nope, nope, just once, just confess once. We're forgiven for good forever, for all time. We never need to do it again. And so we can miss out on the blessing that comes from living in a spiritual practice and discipline, if we go too far to either extreme, the answer is yes and. Because yes, when we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, he forgives us, he justifies us, he makes us clean and perfect before God. And he, he says that we become new creatures. And it shapes the way God sees us. But this spiritual discipline and practice changes the way our transformative life happens. If you want to live in a transformed life, become more like Jesus in this life, then these disciplines, these practices, allow us the privilege of being transformed. And, and here's why. So if God already knows, why do we need to confess? Well, one reason is because concealing our sin is costly. It costs us physically, mentally, socially, physically. Ha, have you ever lived under the weight of a secret? Have you ever lived under the weight of of a sin that you did not want to be found out about. It's uncomfortable for us to confess that, but listen to what, what the psalmist says here in Psalms 32, verse 2, or verse 3 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of of summer. When, when we conceal our sins, when we keep them secret, when we don't even come to terms with them ourselves, it can affect us. The weight of it can be crushing. 
It says it like this in Psalms 38, verse 1. It says, Do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There's no health in my body. So if God knows all of this, why why do we need to come to him in confession? And I think one of the reasons we come to God in confession, in this spiritual practice, in this spiritual discipline, is because it can liberate us from the weight of our secrets. It can liberate us from from the darkness of our own sin when we bring it into the light. See, confession is taking inventory of our own brokenness and taking ownership over it. We're so often like my three-year-old. We're not even aware of our brokenness. We're not even aware of our sin because we're so defensive and we're so on guard and we're so covered up that we can't even see it ourselves. And when confronted even... We say, no, I didn't. As the cookie jar smashed on the floor underneath you. I didn't do it. It's like the the glass is right there. I didn't do it. And what confession does, if we're going to come to the Lord in confession, before we even know what to say, we have to look inward and take inventory. We have to face it head on come to terms with it, and take ownership over those things. It's being honest with ourselves, with God, and many times with others. This is what confession is not, though. This is my rhetoric often. Confession is not justifying our actions. God, I'm sorry, but... You know who I justify myself with all the time? God, yes, but mostly my wife, Laurel. Hey, babe, sorry I did that, but. Sorry I'm backseat driving, but if you just follow a little further behind, I wouldn't be so jumpy. We justify our actions or we make excuses. I I was wrong, but it's because I was provoked. Or, Or sometimes... We, we cover it, we shield it, we, we guard it, we, 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 we put it under the rug. Oftentimes, we're vague. I, I, I do this a lot in my, my own prayer time, confessing to you all. Hey, God, all that bad stuff I did, forgive me for that. That is such a weak response. God, you know, you know, all that stuff. I don't even know what it is, but you know. I'm really sorry for that stuff that I don't even know what it is, but you know what it is. But I promise, I'm sorry. You ever been there? Efficient. (laughs) But powerless. Efficient, but not transformative. Efficient, but weak. Sometimes we rename it. We give it less value than it really was. It's just a mistake instead of a transgression. Just a mistake instead of a sin. Just a mistake instead of just plain out offensive and wrong. Or we take the whole Adam approach. We just pass the buck. She told me to eat it. But most of the time, we postpone. Yeah, that, that thing creeps up. You know it. You see it. You're like, I'll get to that. Next Lent, next Sunday, next season, next opportunity that I have. 
But see, the truth is the discipline of confession. It's a way of, of freeing ourselves from our brokenness, small and in big ways, and inviting Jesus to heal and restore and forgive. It, it moves our sin out of the darkness and into the light. It's the removal of a foreign object. You ever had a bad splinter? My kids get them all the time. Like gnarly ones. Good thing my wife has scalpels and stuff to like remove them. But if you leave a splinter in your body, it, your body will begin to reject it. And it will get infected and it will get contaminated and gross. And the same thing happens with our sin. It's a foreign body. It shouldn't be in us. And what confession does is it allows us to bring it before God and lay it down and remove that thing out of the darkness and bring it in to the light. 1 John 1 says this. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and with the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. Do you see, our covering of our sin doesn't only affect our relationship with God, but it, it really leaks into our relationship with each other. And the reality is, is that most of our sins are absolutely sins against God, but many times they're sins against each other. And what the scriptures tell us, if our sins are against each other, then they're actually sins against God. And it says so right here. But if we walk in the light, if we have fellowship with one another, and that, that his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, here it is. If we bring our sins out of the darkness and into the light, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, but I would love to be purified from all unrighteousness. And what the scriptures point us to is the pathway towards that. And the reality is, is that all unrighteousness affects us day to day. It leaks into our relationships. It leaks into the company we keep. It leaks into the jobs that we have and the parenting that we do and the Christian living we're trying to do together. It says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Notice those are plural. Not the sin, not the one time, the one thing, the one moment you got it wrong, but every time. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. See, confession is a it's purifying and cleansing process that brings our deepest, darkest secrets out of the darkness and into the light. Yes, we're justified when we place our faith in Jesus. Yes, we're justified when we, when we place our faith in Jesus and his blood, it cleanses us. But we can be liberated. We can step into the fullness of life. We can step into the everlasting life abundant, experience the fullness of life here and now when we bring those things to him over and over and he liberates us from those things, purifies us from those things. And once again, this is a step towards repentance. It's a step towards repentance. It's at that moment when we unearth those things and we bring them out and we bring them before God that we say, I no longer want to live this way. I no longer want to be crippled by these things. And Jesus, by your power, would you give me the ability to turn the other way to repent? But I think so many times we try to get to repentance by jumping over confession. We'd rather not address it. We'd rather be vague and have generalizations and just hope that it all goes well. Close your eyes. But God wants us to confront these things. He wants us to know the weight 
of these things. Not so that we can live in the guilt and the shame of it, but so that we can understand the full measure of his grace. See, God's goodness and his grace are best experienced and realized through the discipline of confession. It's, it's the moment when we, when we name those things and we see them for everything that they are. And we see that even in that, God came for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us to understand the magnitude of God's grace, we have to understand the depth of our brokenness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient. For us to understand the sufficiency of his grace, we must know the deficiency of our souls. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. See, confession, it's a radical reliance on the grace of God. A radical reliance on the grace of God. See, it's so interesting. In our, like, legal system, you're innocent until proven guilty. You're innocent until proven guilty. And if you get a lawyer, they never tell you to confess. A lawyer never says, plead guilty. Because when you plead guilty... There is a penalty. When you plead guilty, there is a penalty. In our systems, in our laws, a guilty plea equals penalty. But in God's law, a guilty plea equals peace. When you proclaim your guilt, when you proclaim, when you confess your sin. It is the very act of doing that that God's grace rushes in and brings about reconciliation and renewal and peace. And God restores shalom with you and Him. And He covers the gap of the brokenness in your life with His grace. Hebrews 4 13, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. This is the beautiful parallel of Lent. The 40 days that Jesus was tempted in the desert, experiencing everything that we have. He, 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 doesn't, he isn't far from our pain and suffering. He experienced the fullness of it, yet he did not sin. And then, He says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. See, this is the reason we can confess. Because God has invited us to approach his throne of grace with confidence. He wants to give us access to his grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we can come boldly before the throne of grace because God invites us and says that even in the depth of your brokenness, my mercy, my grace is sufficient. And we can have a boldness. We can access God's grace when we come and we declare the very things that are keeping us separate from him. But the truth is, is we, we don't only confess our sins to God. We're also called to confess our sins to each other. To help old, hold each other accountable in our Christian walks. James 5.16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful 
and effective. This is a, another step in our discipline of confession, a practice to find a trusted person or group of people to be honest with. See, confession is us being honest first with ourselves, with God, and with others. And being in the context of a community where people can trust us with their confessions and trust that we will point them towards God's grace and extend grace towards them, that is what it means to be the church. It doesn't mean that we live free from consequence sometimes. You do something stupid, sometimes you pay for it. But it doesn't absolve us. It doesn't keep us from experiencing the grace of God. And when you live in Christian community to people committed to one another, trying to help each other follow Jesus the best they can, it is a safe and brave place for us to come together and confess. Do you have a person or a people who you can trust this with? If not, we'd love to help you find that. I'm going to close with this. This is a whole other sermon. But that passage that I mentioned at the beginning of Daniel, that it, with Daniel, you know, if you remember the book of Daniel, there, there. In a different land, they're in a foreign land, they've been, their land has been taken over and they're under persecution and they're slaves. And it's in that moment, and that's the story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and the lion's den, and all that, that crazy stuff that's going on, and real persecution happening. And it's in this moment, Daniel chapter 9, where he says, So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition. In fasting and in sackcloth and ashes, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. And he continues to describe the, the pain and the suffering and the consequence of their sin. He goes on here to verse 17. He says, Now our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Do you see what's happening here? See, he isn't just confessing his own sins to God. He isn't just taking those things and confessing them to each other. But he's taking ownership over the sins of his people, and he's moving from me to we. And he's saying there's a, there's a community aspect to this. There's a a generational aspect to this. There's, there's something bigger than me that I'm playing a part in and I'm going to come to you, God, on my behalf. On behalf of the community, on behalf of your people. And there's a communal aspect to this confession. And we will never get to that place if we can't efface and address our own sins. But we should strive, we should get to the place where we can look around and take ownership over our contribution to broken systems, to broken communities, to broken places, and say, God, we need your mercy. We need your mercy. And we, the church, flawed and imperfect, 
We should be able to come to God and say, God, we have missed the mark, and we need your grace. We need your mercy. Confession has the power to move us to that kind of place where we don't only address and confront the, the brokenness and the sin in our own lives, but we can look around and look at the corporate and communal sin, take responsibility for it, and ask God for his grace and for his power to be transformed and to change. So I just want to end with this quick little tip. Where do you start? How, how do you begin? And if you're like me, sometimes you just move towards generalizations. God, all those things, I don't even know what they are, but you could maybe just forgive me for those. Maybe you could pray this prayer, Psalms 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And lead me in the way everlasting. If you're having trouble identifying or even being aware, and this is, this is so common for us, we're just so oblivious. Start with this. God, search me. Reveal in me. It won't be long before things start coming to light. And when we can step out of the darkness and into the light, we begin to heal. We begin to be transformed. So I want to close by praying this prayer in Psalm 51. And if you know David, the story of David, he had been called the man after God's own heart, but had sinned greatly multiple times. And this is a response to his great sin of committing adultery and murdering her husband. And I know you might think, like, I've never done anything that bad. But let's just close our eyes, and I'm going to pray this prayer. And maybe you can see some correlation with your own life. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach your transgressors your ways so that sinners return back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings whole, the bulls will be offered on your altar. 
God, would you move us to your throne of grace in confidence that your mercy, that your grace is sufficient. May our confession be access to your grace. May you transform and cleanse us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.